Hello there and welcome to Beyond the Surface, where the saying to be seen is to be understood comes to life. I want to begin by first honouring the traditional custodians of the land we live and work on. I live and work on Gundungurra land and I acknowledge the traditional landowners of my guests near and far. I pay my respects to the elders past, present and emerging for they hold the memories, the traditions and cultures of our First Nations people. The land below my feet is, was and always will be Aboriginal land. I'm no stranger to the profound journey of pain, grief, anger and heartbreak that often accompanies the loss of church, community, faith and the unwinding of our core beliefs. In the midst of this, though, I found healing in the stories shared by others who walked a similar path to me. Here in the warmth of these digital walls, I want you to feel at home. This is a space where your memories and your story is not just acknowledged, but deeply seen and believed. So kick back, relax, and let's embark on a journey where your story is not just heard, but embraced. I want to welcome you to a community where storytelling is a powerful force. This is Beyond the Surface. Welcome, Nikki. Thanks for joining me. Thank you so much. I appreciate you uh, inviting me on. Oh, I'm so excited. I love your Instagram, by the way. Can we just start oh, with thank that? You. <laughs> it's so great. Um, thank you. I, I just think that there are certain ways that people can talk about the topic of religious trauma or spiritual abuse. Um, and I love um, the... I hate the the Instagrams and the social medias and stuff that um, berate people who are still yeah. in faith communities because mm-hmm. we once mm-hmm. were those people. And I'm, so yep, yep, you know, yep. I, I just think approaching it from a more compassionate, empathetic mm-hmm. stance is so mm-hmm. much better. Um, so I, yeah, I love your Instagram. I think it's great. Oh, thank you. Thank you so much. I appreciate that. So let's start. Where does your story start, Nikki? Hmm. Do we have five hours and some coffee, right? <laughs> I wish. I wish we had five oh, yeah. hours. Well, I can start off saying that um, I come from uh, what I would call a religious narcissistic family system. Okay. So that's two, that's a double whammy of two toxic, um, you know, families of, of, of origin style, so to speak. Yeah. And um, so being raised, especially as a black woman, you know, and not to hit with statistics so early, but in America, eight out of 10 um, black Americans identify as Christians. Mm. So um, if you didn't go to church at home, if you went to your friend's house, you were going to church. If you went to your cousin's house somewhere or shape or form, you were getting into church. Right. Um, and so, you know, I was raised in an environment that, like that, but there was also some narcissistic dynamics that took place in, in my family of origin. And so um, I had, I was not conscious of the fact that I was, you know, in a, in a slow, I, I kind of call my family almost like my first cult. And we'll get into mm. that later um, as far as how many I've been in, yeah. but um, it was where I learned to be conditioned to uh, looking to authority to define my reality, mm. uh, looking to authority figures to tell me what to do and where to go and to guide my life. I mean, now when you're growing up and you're a child, that's normal. Mm. But when the dysfunction is a part of that system, you learn to disconnect from your own intuition, your own inner compass. You learn to not believe yourself Mm. and you put that responsibility on others. And so I didn't know, my parents probably didn't know, but I was being conditioned to eventually be, you know, attracted to toxic uh, spiritual communities and you know we'll get into that some more but that's yeah. how I started out oh my goodness I mean that mm-hmm. indoctrination is uh, um I think it is just I mean I've done so many trauma training right and not once mm-hmm. not once is indoctrination ever 
in the list of things that can cause trauma for children. And I Mm -hmm. just think, Mm -hmm. you know, it, it is just the beginning of, like you said, that disconnection from yourself. Yeah. Um, yeah. What yeah, was yeah. some of that conditioning that you experienced as a little girl? Yeah. And, you know, prefacing and the reason why I'm not going to try to belabor the point, but just being a black woman and yeah. having, you know, that, uh, that foundation of, you know, my mom's from the South, my grandparents on my mom's side. So slavery, the effects of the enslaved, the effects of Jim Crow reconstruction mm-hmm. era, these things that took place in America, that affected the generational line. And so, you know, um, on one hand, I describe what I grew up in, my family of origin, but I have understanding as to why, you know, the generational trauma continues to get passed down. And the older generation in, in the Black community itself, don't talk, don't tell. If you survived it, if you're out of it, it's probably out of you and you don't need to talk about that. What are you going to therapy for? You know, you don't need that. You just need Jesus. And so I was surrounded by that type of language majority of my life. And but particularly in my family of origin, forgiveness was a big theme. Mm. You know, that was pushed a lot. And, and it's not like anyone sat down and said, if you want to get ahead in the world, you want to just forgive everybody and everything will be nice. But th- that's what was relayed to me. So mm-hmm. keeping the peace, you know, making sure everybody is happy, you know, people please if you must, mm-hmm. you know, and if people do you wrong, you know, you may be upset for a minute, but just forgive them so God can forgive you. So you're in right standing with God and mm-hmm. then maybe things will be better in that that relationship. And so I've watched it be modeled out from my family of origin, and I've, I've seen it be um, imposed on me to do the same. So as I was in my adolescent years, and I had issues with some of my interpersonal relationships, friends, and things of that nature, and I, I would share that with my family, I was usually at fault mm-hmm. because, you know... <laughs> It was said, you know, I always, I had to talk about something. I had, I was the one like, this is not right. Do we not see this pink elephant in the room? Do we not smell this pink elephant in the yeah. room? And so, you know, when I've been conditioned to, oh no, that situation, it was probably you because, you know, you like to chatter, 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 you know, and, but I didn't really understand then, um, that was part of their coping mechanism. Mm -hmm. You know, that was how they coped in a maladaptive way was to deny and to ignore and to dismiss. And so not only was that verbally um, said to me, but it was demonstrated. Mm -hmm. My, my perspective was not safe. What I called reality was not safe. My inner compass was not safe. I was not safe. Mm -hmm. And this is just, you know, and this is coupled with scriptures that were used that would try to um, enhance those beliefs, you know. So forgiveness was one, um, you know, loving your neighbor. But, you know, that scripture talks talks about loving your neighbor as you love yourself for some reason. People forget that part, yeah. you know? I yeah. know. I know I did as I got older and, you know, I claimed Christianity for myself and, and I had my own walk with God. I was not doing that. I was trying to please God mm-hmm. and then I was trying to please people, but I forgot about myself, you know? So, you know, obedience, prayer. I think one of the other strong uh, values that was instilled in my family of origin was this window, this box, this 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 fishbowl, if you will, this, everything you need is in church, it's mm-hmm. in God, it's in faith. It's in prayer and fasting. It's in the Bible. That's it. Anything outside of that, probably not as safe, probably is not authentic. At the end of the day, there was a song that was, I don't remember the name of the song, but part of the song is very typical in in a Black church. There's a saying that only what you do for Christ will last. Oh, wow. So there's a lot that can be pulled from that. But if mm-hmm. that's used in a very abusive and erroneous way, people start to tend to think that everything else that does not have 
some type of Christian theme to it, then it, it has no merit and it's insignificant. And I kind of grew up seeing that and believing that, you know, so I'll stop right there. <laughs> and it and it is all consuming, right? Like it literally just oh, yeah. think, you know, it's not just going to church on a Sunday. It's your worldview. It's your, like you said, your compass. Yes. It's your value system. It's your mm -hmm. morals. It determines right from wrong. And so it is so mm -hmm. much more than just going to church on a Sunday. Right, right. I mean, there are some families that they go to church on Sunday, but they don't bring it home with them, yeah. if you will. They still live some re relative normal life. You know, they, they'll still go to the movies. They'll still listen to music, secular music. But, you know, I believe, David, like, I believe in God. I'm going to go to church every now and then. But that was not my family. Yeah. We were very religious always in church and um you know that's kind of the environment that I grew up in and, and you know there was always friction between different family members and I and, and I didn't understand way until after the cult involvement and I had to start unraveling all these threads where the developmental trauma and the religious trauma were intersecting and that's when you're like wait I have to process this wait all of this connects with this yeah. You know, so yeah. Yeah. It's um it's like I use the analogy, it's like detangling Christmas lights when reality oh, it's wanna yeah. like I like that. Yeah. Can I use that? Absolutely. I will, I will reference you. I, that is it that is so true. Yeah. Oh yeah. And all you want to yeah. do is yeah. just throw them in the bin and start again. Yes. You can't. You can't do that. No, it's your life. Really? Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. Okay, you've wow. mentioned it a few times, and I know that okay. um, I've, I've read a bit about <laughs> your your story, and so I know there is mm -hmm. not just one cult to come. So let's start unraveling yeah. that yeah. a little bit. Okay, okay. So that was, you know, the baseline. That was the foundation. And as I got older, even in adolescence, um, I found myself attracted to a lot of toxic relationships, friendships, you know, boyfriends, things of that nature. And again, I didn't understand, but I knew that there was this pulse in me. I couldn't fully articulate it then, but there was this thing in me that's like, I want to be seen. No one sees me. I, I, I want to be loved. Who's going to love me rightly without all of this dysfunction? Yeah. Couldn't articulate it then, but I think that was that was the energy that was being emitted from me. And so on one hand, I'm aware of that. But on the other hand, I feel like it almost kind of put a bullseye on me. And because other thing is family of origin, I was not, I was taught that predatory people are, are kind of safe. Not directly. No one set me down and said, yeah, a predator is safe. But with all the people pleasing, with all the forgiving, with all the, they're okay. I don't, so I start to think when I start to pick up signs, because, you know, having some empathic nature, being intuitive, I would realize something's not right with this person. Something's not right with this situation. But I would just say, oh, that's just me. I'm yeah. pretty sure it's okay. So I picked that up and I learned that. So when I would meet friends or boyfriends or different uh, communities. And if I saw something, I would dismiss it. I would not trust my intuition. Because, you know, a lot of times our intuition is not like we have all the receipts yeah. when we first start picking things up. Yeah, It's more of a, we sense it, we feel it, but then the receipts may come later. Mm. But I did not know to wait for those receipts. So I would feel it, I didn't see any proof around me. So yeah. then I just would determine, oh, it was, it was me. Yeah. So this continued. Go ahead, go ahead. Oh, I was go just going to say, ahead, go ahead, go ahead. not to mention that even with like when someone has a strong intuition, that's suppressed anyway, because you are not supposed to rely yeah. on your own understanding. No. Nope. Even if you nope. do have that strong intuition, you naturally mm -hmm. learn to suppress that and ignore it because- uh -huh. Mm -hmm. you know, I'm not so, you know, do not lean on your own understanding, you know, yes, and you know, so all thy ways acknowledge him. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> absolutely. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. yeah. 
So, so you have the family of origin that kind of teaches you that. And then you have the scripture. And mm -hmm. then if you connect it to an abusive leader, they use that to hook you to their understanding because they're delegated by God to tell you what to do. Mm -hmm. yeah. We'll get there. But anyway, so at 19, I got saved. Um, you know, I'm thinking this is probably the first podcast where I'm fully telling my story. So oh, I love yes. <laughs> yeah. So I've talked bits and pieces, but okay. So at 19, um, I was in college and I started hearing about this song that was popular in the rap community It's called Who's That Peeping in My Window. It's such an old, old song. And it, it intrigued me. I liked the beat. I asked a friend of mine, hey, what are they talking about? And he's like, you don't know? No, that's what I'm asking you. What are they talking about? So he starts to tell me about you know, the New World Order and secret societies and conspiracy theories type stuff. And I had never heard this type of stuff. And so I said, hmm, I was very curious. So I, I went to the library, I went to the bookstore, I bought books and man, did I start. That was where I cut my teeth going down a rabbit hole, my first rabbit hole. But everything that I read and when I said I went down a rabbit hole, like I, summer break came, I went back home I stayed in the library the whole summer because, you know, I had to connect. I had to unravel the cord, right? Yeah. But things started pointing me to the book of Revelation, Ezekiel, Daniel, all the end time apocalyptic books. Um, because up until this point, I was attending church, but it wasn't real for me mm. until I started reading all this stuff. And then as I started reading things, I'm like, well, wait a minute. If these things are going to happen, then Jesus is the only way to stop this. I mean, I'm going to be honest. I was I had selfish reasons for giving my life to Christ at first because I'm like, well, you're the only one that's going to be able to save us from this. So let me just, I mean, I'm familiar with you a little bit. Let me just make this real. Yeah. And so I got <laughs> saved in my basement at the age of 19. I didn't wait to go down, you know, to an altar call or respond to one. I got saved and I said, if you are really real. I need you to make this real to me. And, you know, and so that's what I did. And I took it serious. I stopped listening to secular music. Like immediately I went into black or white, all or nothing type of, you know, it was already in my system. So it was easy for me to just lean into that, you know? Um, and so as I'm eating all this food, spiritual food, I went back to the church I grew up in. It wasn't enough because now I'm feasting after all these things. So I think, and you know, the church is boring now. And within three months, they had me teaching the, the youth uh, ministry. And it went from five to like almost 50 kids. And I'm talking to them about Jesus is returning and all this other stuff. I mean, they liked it, I guess. I, I think about it now and I'm like, <laughs> but I did all of this and it wasn't enough, the church I was at. Like, I, you know, I had a pastor tell me this as I was processing a lot of my, my experience later. And, and I'm so appreciative that he said it because I didn't realize till later on when I look back at my church history, I was almost like, as they say, chasing the dragon. Mm -hmm. I got that one high, that one hit during that initial stage. And I wanted something that was intense and demonstrative. And I couldn't deal with the quiet church or just, Oh, we go to church once in a bloom. Like I needed more of God. And so I found myself in my first cult. And um, this was um, predominantly black church. And um, the pastor was a female and her husband was the worship director. And it was filled with a whole bunch of young people, a lot of young adults. And that was like, you mean y'all are serious about this too? I'm serious about this too. Oh, wow. So we, and it wasn't even so much what they did in church. It was what they did outside of church. They were on fire for God. We prayed, we fasted, we evangelized, we, we did, we worshiped together. And so I just was like, this is home. Mm -hmm. This is what I need in my life, you know? And then the, the actual pastor, what she called herself an apostle, I started to connect with her instantaneously because she, at the beginning, there was a lot of love bombing and she mm -hmm. reflected the unmet needs that I still had with my mom. 
You know, she wanted to know about my life. She spent time with me. She helped me open my first checking account and put the first hundred dollar deposit in, you know. So I stayed under her and looked at her like my spiritual mom. And so, you know, I'm 19, 20 and I am like doing all the things. A lot of my giftings, which I now realize I don't believe it just it be because I used, I used to hear all the time, your gifts aren't for the church. Your gifts are for the church. And now that that is not my life, I am even more connected to know my gifts are for me and for those who I feel like and I need to connect with. And so, but at the time, that's where I cut my teeth and became aware of some of the special things that I believe um, I, I, I put, you know, certain things I possess. And um Everything was beautiful until um, <laughs> I got pregnant by her son. So my uh, my 23-year-old daughter now is the grandchild of my first co-leader. So, yeah. <laughs> Yikes. Talk about tangled Christmas lights, Nikki. <laughs> yes. Yes. <hey. laughs> and we are just getting started. So, yeah. Goodness. Mm -hmm. Okay. And uh -huh. I can imagine that that would not have went down well. No, it didn't. Mm. No, it didn't. I mean, there's a lot of details to it, but I have more quotes yeah. to, to talk about. So I just, you know, I, I'll just say <laughs> it did not end well. Yeah. And it, it ended very traumatic to the point that, you know, she kind of physically assaulted me. And, and, and it took that for me to actually say, with my daughter in my hand, for me to say, okay, I can't be here anymore. You know, I, I can't do this anymore. And the thing about me that was, I think, instilled in my family of origin and just with, you know, my version of Christianity, you know, what I was ingesting at the time was you don't quit. Yeah. You know, the hardship you're going through, you're suffering for Christ. Yeah, so I never looked at it like, Right. I never looked at it as abuse. Yeah. Right. I looked at it. And, this is hard. This is hard. This is painful. A lot of tears and confusion, confusion, but I did not see it as abuse. Therefore, I remained and I fasted and I prayed and I tried to endure because I wanted to be rewarded by God. Mm -hmm. I wanted to please him. And I wanted to say, you know, the devil didn't win. You know, there was something that my ego wanted to be able to say that. But at that point, when it came down to, you know, her physically um, assaulting me, you know, with my daughter in my hand, it was just like, okay, mm. I can't come back here anymore, you know? So that's kind of how I had my exit from that cult. Oh, my goodness. And, I mean, we know that... I mean, cults and fundamental religious communities attract <clears throat> vulnerable, right? So, you Absolutely. know, in that space, you would have emulated vulnerability. Um, yeah. And I am not surprised that mm -hmm. you landed you in another mm -hmm. community. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and, of course, you know, you don't see it as such. Yeah, of course. You know, a lot of times, you know, vulnerability is why you know and and I, I i wait to a lot of my clients that i do when i coach if and when they're ready some may not get to that point and i respect that because the last thing you do is you push a, 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 a trauma survivor to you know we may see but i don't i don't like to do that but for me a big part of my healing came when i was able to say okay these are the abusive things that happen from the leaders and authority figures. Mm. And I'm going to put it here. I'm not dismissing it. I'm going to put it here. But now, Nikki, if we want to stop this cycle, let's start looking at what did I come to the table with? What, did, what knapsack did I bring into these communities mm. of unmet needs and wounds and traumas and desires and longings and a lot of those longings and desires are on a human level there is nothing wrong with someone saying i want to connect with the higher power i want to i want to be a better person i want to belong mm. i want to be seen and validated like 
those are normal desires, but they were all wrapped up in that Christmas light cord and on my knapsack and into these communities I went. And I was not conscious of that. Many times we're not conscious of that when we enter relationships and things of that nature. And so once I, 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 you know, got into these places, it, of course, it's like, oh, this is heaven. This is home. This is where I belong. Yeah. yeah it's very euphoric. Yeah. And, you know, coupled with what music can do mm. to us emotionally and psychologically, and then a lot of the communities I grab, excuse me, I gravitated to, they were very into the, the prophetic yeah, and prophetic love, love bombing and, you know, making you feel like you really, really belong here and God is calling you here. So it was hard yeah. to deny that pull internally and externally. Yeah, yeah. absolutely. I mean, emo emotional manipulation is one of the hardest things yes. to be aware of because yeah it's designed to make you feel a certain way and if it's designed to make you feel seen and like you are a part of a community or a family yeah. family mm -hmm. language that's used um right how are you you know you're not meant to see it it's designed in a way mm -hmm. for you not to see it mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. so how did cult number two come about <laughs> Well, you know, after that, you know, I, I took a break for a little bit, not a long break, but enough to start to do some digging and unpack a little bit of what I went through. Okay. So <laughs> I found scriptures that kind of spoke to how she, as the leader, treated myself and others. It wasn't just me, you know. So I found the scripture that talked about shepherds that have, you know, um, that are leading wrongly versus right. I found things to say, okay, I think I came to the conclusion that it, it was toxic. I don't know if I really fully came to the conclusion that it was a cult. I might have, but it was more spiritualizing things. I did not understand cognitively, psychologically what I was in. Therefore, you know, eventually it was like, okay, well, I want to, I want to go back to church. So mm -hmm. I did find a ch another church, but the church I found, I would say probably out of my church history between, you know, this is probably one of the safer churches out of my church history that I went to next. So it was not a cult, mm -hmm. but this is the thing in 2024, like, you know, when people think of cults, they, they, a, a lot of times they think of, okay, you have to be there. There mm -hmm. are people connected to cults online. Absolutely. Right? So yeah. even though I was in this safer church, more healthier church, I was still connecting to a lot of these ministries online and they were pulling and pulling and I'm, I'm getting all this indoctrination, even though I'm not there, but it pulled on me enough to say, you know what? I think I want to go visit this place. I know it's not in the town that I'm from, but I want more of God. I I want to be a good soldier of Christ. I want to do the thing. You know, I have my daughter at this time. I want her to know God like this too. And so, you know, eventually I found myself moving to Kansas City, Missouri, okay. and I beca became part. Yeah. So right now, the cult that I was a part of then has been in the news since October with all the things. And it's, I'll name this one. It's called International House of Prayer. Wow. in Kansas City, Missouri. So yeah. So I became a part of that and it was like, woo. but again, International House of Prayer in Kansas City, they were very end time orientated. So remember, that's how I got saved, you know, with an uh, end time apocalyptic type of palette, if you will. And prayer was there. Worship was there. Young people were there, right? So it was a little bit, it was, it was an upgrade from what I came out of. And because it was bigger and not smaller, like that initial first cult, it, it uh, felt safer because, you know, you can do whatever you want and things of that nature. And so um, I, you know, got my saddle and picked up my daughter and say, we're going to go and we want, I want this so bad. I'm going to move and take a risk and do this. And um, 
you know, I'll, I'll pause right there. Oh my goodness. How long were you at IHOP for? Um, I was in Kansas City for seven years. I would say hardcore part of IHOP, maybe about four to five. The other years um, was the other cults that I joined out there okay. that what I would call IHOP adjacent. Okay. So, but I was still frequenting IHOP's prayer room. My daughter was going to a school that was IHOP adjacent. And so I couldn't escape it altogether, even though I branched off into, uh, you know, other uh, cults or what have you. So um, you couldn't get away from the teaching. You couldn't get away from the prayer room. There was still a lot, I believe. I just wanted something smaller. Mm. And, you know, there's a lot of things that was going on that I just was like, I don't know if I can fully do this, but I can do it part time, if you will. Yeah. So, yeah. Oh, my goodness. What is it like yeah. having been a part of that space and now watching it unfold publicly? Yeah. <laughs> I will say this. Um, I was a little bit angry when the stuff first came out because I was like, okay, I worked through all of this. That has totally not been my life for some years now. I'm so far removed from that. Yeah. And you want to hear something funny? The weekend before all this stuff, this stuff dropped, I had just visited Missouri for the first time since I left years ago. Oh my God. But it wasn't Kansas City, it was St. Louis, which is on the opposite side. And I went there. Um, to be a part of a retreat con for spiritual abuse and cult survivors. So, oh my goodness, the irony! So I, I was there. The irony, right? Oh. I went there because um, I'm I'm a part of a Tears of Eden organization, and I'm on the board. So I was there helping and being a part of it. Came back the following weekend, and all hell breaks loose, so to speak. And <laughs> really? I was like. Said, right? I said, this That's is so crazy. crazy. <laughs> yes, right? But I was angry because I'm like, I have things to do and all this stuff is just popped on my lap. But I'm like, you, this is an inconvenience. I, I know it's yeah. not, not what people have been through, but just you are invading my life and I did not choose for this to happen. That was my initial raw feeling. But over time, I said, you know what, Nikki, there's a reason. Mm. There is still stuff here, as it would be. Like, you don't heal and recover in two seconds from years of ind indoctrination. There are waves and levels to get through. So I was mad initially, but then I leaned into it and said, you know what? No, this is good. There's stuff that needs to come up, you know? So I... I, I allowed the emotions that I could not allow back then to come up. So rage has been coming up and, and anger, you know, and, and, and deep sadness and grief, not just for the time I spent there and, but so many lives and to come to awareness of the real foundation of that ministry mm -hmm. is I didn't, I wasn't cognitively ready to understand even in my initial processing it when I first came out my last cult, but now I'm more aware and I see it differently. And I'm like, I I'm going to give you my honest opinion. And I don't even know if, if, if I have the expertise level to say this, but this is just Nikki saying this, right? Honestly, what is going on there? I would actually say it is probably more paramount, more insidious than even the Jim Jones cult. Okay. Wow. Yeah. Okay. Which, yes, it ended with mass murders and I'm not belittling that experience and what happened. But that was one area with that particular group. And even though it had mass effect on the whole globe when that came out, this ministry and the heart of of America has so many tributaries to it globally mm. that it's not just that place that's being affected. There are so many houses of prayers globally that are hurting and in mourning and are trying to process. Was this all 
a hoax? Was this really real? How do I, you know, quantify my, my faith level? It's a lot to unpack, mm. a lot to unpack. So my heart goes out for every person, even if they never moved there and was a part of it physically. There are many people that were a part of it online and believe strongly and they're being impacted as well. So yeah. Yeah, that's a it's a that's many Christmas cords uh, untied. So yeah. It's a lot of Christmas lots tied. <laughs> yes, yes, yes. A whole block, maybe. Oh, <laughs> I'm sorry. How do you look back you at your time at IHOP now having been uh, part of it? I, you know, that vulnerability that you were mentioning earlier, you know, and just, you know, us just being open. I mean, I, I can see the cord. I've already been laying that foundation out so far in our conversation, but I'll say this, right? Because I'm trying to be nice, but if I can be <laughs> candid, then that's okay. <laughs> Say whatever you like. I'm like, I don't, I don't want to get you in trouble, but no, not at all. A, a lot of, I will say, in the American evangelical or American also fundamental church over here, because a lot of their ideology ex is exported globally. So it's a lot that's starting here, but a lot of them, their root system. Many of the people that they listened to and believed, and then they went and start their own ministry. A lot of these people, Samantha, a lot of them have a lot of psychiatric disorders. There are a lot of people who I'm not in a place to diagnose. I'm not a clinician, but and just from my knowledge, many of them are perhaps beyond narcissistic. Many are part of the dark triad. Yeah. Many of them may be schizophrenic, having hallucinations and, and, and delusions and calling it visions. Mm -hmm. Right. And a lot of people don't see it as such. Yeah. And this is the foundation of many of the ministries over here. Mm -hmm. And they have learned how to manipulate so many people, even the prophetic that people think is prophetic. It's not prophetic. They're doing the research online on some of these people. And then they will call you out and you're thinking there is a lot of trickery and scamming going on. And my heart breaks because a lot of these people, including it was me, it was probably you. We just wanted to get closer to God. We weren't looking to be hoodwinked and abused and taken advantage of. We didn't want that. Um, but this... This this new arm, and I don't say new because it's been around 60, 70, you know, from the, the Jesus People movement to the Latter Rain movement to a lot of these historical roots. What it has produced are a lot of these leaders hoodwinking and manipulating and abusing the people, whether they realize it or not. Yeah. And these are some of the, you know, when I looked at the history of the leader of IHOP's mentors and really seeing it from a whole nother perspective, I said, oh, gosh, like, I did not know this. I knew it, but I did not know. I did not see. And so, it, like I said, I've allowed rage to come up. I've allowed anger to come up, you know, and, and grief. I'm still grieving. You know, I'm writing a lot of letters to that version of Nikki mm -hmm. that existed and did not know. I am talking to my inner child, talking to my inner teenager and that young person that was just wanting to know God and say, you did not know. It's okay. Yeah. You did not know, you know, we we're going to be okay, but don't blame yourself. It's not your fault, you know? And, and, and that is important to me in general. This is important to convey that to my, my clients and people I speak to, but I am really walking this out in real time now. And I'm taking my own medicine on a deeper level, unpacking that experience. Absolutely. So, yeah. And I think anybody who works in the religious trauma or deconstruction or spiritual abuse space mm -hmm. is walking alongside in their own journey because, um, you know, healing is not a destination. And I think mm -mm. uh, um, mm -mm. David Haywood, the naked pastor, said, you know, that deacon yes, lifestyle, you know, it's also not a destiny. And so mm -hmm. 
Um, we are walking the same walk just at different paces mm -hmm. or at different stages. Yeah. Um, okay. Yeah. So you said that the cults that came after IHOP were IHOP adjacent. Mm -hmm. What? Yeah. What yeah. Was your What was the experience like for you coming out of the final cult? What was that like? Yeah. Yeah. Um, great question, because that was really the straw that broke the camel's back. Um, yes, I have did a number on me, but I think that last cult probably would be the summation of all of them that I experienced. And, um, it was not as, as, um, as popular or known. As, as IHOP, I don't even think we had a website at the time. You know, the cult has since dissolved. So, you know, it started out as a house church before I got there and it evolved into, you know, a church or a ministry. And, um, you know, I got invited into that. Um, that, yeah, that, that, that church. Um, and again, I was a single mom at this time. So my daughter, is, is tracking along with me in these different places, you know? So it was, and kind of, and I'm going to be honest, that was a big part of my motivation to not give up on myself, mm. to not throw in the towel because many, as you know, deal with suicidal ideations. Many, you know, can find themselves having to be, you know, in mental institutions and there's no shame with that, but this type of trauma and abuse, it has such a deep impact that sometimes that is, you know, what happens with, with survivors. But every time I felt like I might be at that place where I would have to go, I would just re be reminded of my daughter, yeah. you know, and she's a little bit like her mama in the sense where she loves to learn. She's very curious. Mm -hmm. She likes to read, you know, and so... In that last cult specifically, she was much older in her teenage years, but she would be in there taking notes herself mm. and, you know, having her own personal relationship. So when we exited, there was a lot of unpacking that still had to be had for her, you know, At, and in the beginning, I tried to withhold a lot of information, but it got to the point where she needed answers and validation. So I had to help her. Um, to the point that I felt was normal and healthy. At the same token, I wanted her to start her own process of what deconstruction looked like, where it wasn't the same thing where now I'm following mom all the time. She was old enough to find out what she wanted to do. But anyway, mm. yeah, this last cult, um, if you will, the, the teachings I think were even more sinister uh, more darker. Uh, there was a romantic, a romance with martyrdom right. that was was uh, more insidious than even at IHOP, mm. because even their worship songs at IHOP would sing about the end times. Because IHOP's uh, uh, end times view, and I'm not, I can't break it all down like I used to. When I used to have all this remembered, but. <laughs> I have since allowed it to just dissipate, right? Yes. <laughs> didn't want to hold that anymore. But in, in layman's terms, they did not believe that the church was going to get raptured um, out before the seven years of tribulation. They believe that those who are part of his bride, those who are his real church, they will be here and yeah. they will kind of, in those seven years, go through great suffering and um, prove to Jesus that the bride was comparable to him. Oh, my goodness. So that is part of the reason why the prayer room went 24-7, because you want an incense to go up before God all the time, but then you want a place to build up these forerunners who will be needed during those seven years, you know, to go and preach and encourage and endure and things of that nature. So a lot of the music, a lot of the intercession was surrounded by these themes. Mm -hmm. um, but this last cult took some of that and went even deeper with 
like bridal in, um, bridal mysticism where the whole what is who is actually part of the bride of Christ there was very an elite type of teaching to it that everybody wouldn't be a part of it so then you start to feel like you have to suffer to be chosen to be a part of his bride and um and perhaps maybe even be a part of a martyr circle to mm -hmm. fully fully be chosen so even though obviously I'm alive so that didn't happen physically but psychologically I would abase myself yeah. I would think of myself as, as nothing that I I was nothing but a vessel to be used by God like he loved me but I learned that he wanted to use me more than he loved me I was I was an object mm -hmm. right and so you know, surrendering, suffering, dealing with whatever happened within that cult. And it's not abuse. It's just suffering for Christ. So I, this was enforced even more. And um, I, if I could take a, a pencil and use that as an example of how much I erased myself when I was in that cult, I would say maybe down to the feet. I had the feet left to get the hell out of the ah. <laughs> but so much you know from sexuality to how I thought about myself you know to how I thought about uh interpersonal relationships to preparing to endure during the end times and um there was a lot of other way weird teaching that I just don't want to scare people with <laughs> Um, maybe you and I could talk about that another time, but th there was so, so much that, you know, um, I, I, I think I was a shell of myself. You know, my authentic self was already being eroded over a big course of my life from what I've already shared. But I think this place really just really knocked the wind out of me. So, you know, I did not exit. It ended, which... Because I'm sitting here thinking, this, like, these like are... how did I get out? Yeah, these are the cults that you see on the news that end in mass suicides and yeah, 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 that sort of thing. Yeah. And so I'm sitting here going, how on earth did you get out? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And and I will preface this with this. It, I was so wanting more. That was, like, the preeminent theme in a lot of these cults. This is why I kept cult topping number one I didn't realize they were cults and I wanted more but I was in addition to being on the ground physically in these places I was still listening to a lot of these leaders that I was talking about earlier um I don't know if you're familiar with the NAR movement which is new apostolic reformation and I might have to come back from your pod podcast to explain that but in a nutshell it is a movement that a lot of these apostles and prophets um, felt that God was starting a third reformation after the Martin Luther Reformation, which is now the tone and the face of the church needed um, a facelift, so to speak, and that God was delegating the prophets and the apostles only to do the facelifting and give the marching orders for the church. Well, and like so bring over the other cults. Yes. Yes, exactly. Exactly. And so, <laughs> right. So they, um, they felt that like a lot of the regular churches were boring and they were not, mm -hmm. um, going out and, um, taking dominion for Christ that, they felt that they, their ideology was something called the seven mountain mandate. And that means that there are at least seven major spheres of influence in, on the planet. Arts and entertainment, family, um, government, um, religion. Uh, I can't think of all of them right now. But these, these mountains of influence, they felt that or feel that at the apex of these mountains, it's all of the devil's people. He's over the arts and entertainment. This is demonic and that's demonic. And so, right, of course, everybody's demonic. <laughs> but at the, at the base of these mountains are 
the, is the church. And they felt we're not winning this battle for Christ, you know, so we got to get up on the top. So how do we do that? Well, this is when they start getting very strategic and start teaching these types of teaching in the churches. And it totally changes kind of the face of fundamentalism, evangelicalism. And so now you don't necessarily, not that you don't pay attention to the pastor role, but it's really about the apostles and the prophets. And, you know, it's a whole, like I said, I will, I can come back and talk about that. But anyway, that teaching, I was listening to ministers talk and, and, and prophets or whatever. I was eating off of this in my spare time, if I even had any. And still at this cult simultaneously, you know, and so I'm ingested. I sometimes I sit back and I'm like, I can't believe that was my world. Like, you know, when this I have stuff came back up, I was like, all these memories flooded back because I feel like I've lived like three or four different lives so far because that's, you know, mm -hmm. I had to totally come out of it. But anyway, it it ended because the cult leader, the last cult leader, he felt that God was calling him to go and tag team with another cult leader who was really into martyrdom and, you know, almost like a, a spiritual masochist, if you will. Like he was just very consumed with how much can you surrender for Christ? Like, and so my cult leader said, hey, I'm going to go over there. God's calling me there. This has got to end. Do not try to duplicate this. We did a lot of spiritual warfare in that in that cult mm -hmm. over the city. And, and he's like, if y'all try to do this again, you know, y'all going to get affected by it. It was, it was a mess. So it ended. And like I said, it was bittersweet because I don't know if I would have left. Yeah. I mean, eventually, maybe. But I don't I would have stayed longer, even though I was going through so much. Like, I don't have time to talk about specifically the abuse that I received from him directly. I'm just giving you a little preview of what the cult was like. Um, but it ended, and now I had a chance to, as I say, the smelling salt can hit me because I'm not under directly that spell anymore, and I have a chance to breathe and to evaluate what the hell was I just in? Like, what, what is, what was this, you know? And, and, you know, sometimes when you're driving and you're quiet, all of a sudden things come up and you're like, oh, you know, it was, it was those type of, it was that type of, of saying for me. And I started realizing it always started with the scriptures first and this tag to this tag to this. And then I found myself saying, I went to Christian counselors. They were trying to encourage me to forgive him and, you know, didn't touch any of this with a can of paint. I mean, I, honestly, I, I can't blame them. <laughs> but they, you know, they, you know, invalidated me some more. And I just was like, okay. And this is when I was still in Kansas City. I said, I, I can't do this anymore. It's hard to go to the prayer room because even though it was a different ministry, they, they believe some similar things. And um, I just, I just was like, okay, the church world right now, is not feeding me with whatever this is that I just went through. And I was so scared to do it because remember everything outside that fishbowl is demonic, but I was experiencing some raw, acute PTSD symptoms when I left, you know, insomnia flashbacks. I was having dreams of him really, really hurting me. Um, I was still running to him and his wife in the city because you know our daughters went to the same school and I, I just I, I I was a mess and so I did something that I probably would have never done back then which was I actually went on YouTube and I started listening to people I wasn't in the church mm. and I found uh, Dr. Stephen Hassan and he was talking about his experience in the Moonies and I started listening to Yanya Lalish and her talking about cults and and I start reading and I'm like, wait, wait, I don't, I don't see anybody talking about the mind of Christ. And so I don't see any scriptures in here, but yet it was starting to give me language and understanding. And I'm like, wait, 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 wait. And so I just, again, 
I went on a bunny trail, but this time it was to help bring awareness and get some of that psychoeducation. And I did it afraid because I was so programmed that this was wrong. Everything I needed was in the church, in God. I didn't need to look elsewhere, but I was so desperate and I was, I was hurting so much. You know, my daughter used to say she would come home from school and she could just feel the heaviness oh. in the house because I worked from home. Because I was just, I was, I was trying to hold everything together. Um, but as I started to read some of this stuff and everything, I eventually had to move away from Kansas City because I just was physically getting sick there, you know, and I just, I said, I can't do this anymore. But um, I started to just learn at first, you know, and once I moved away, once to get some, some therapy, they didn't fully understand this stuff. And I, I wasn't even mad at the time. I was educating them more, um, but in a way, I mean, that's what I needed because my PTSD was too acute to not go to therapy and not get the help. So I stayed with it, but I started to educate myself for me. I never planned on doing what I'm doing now at all for me and for my daughter because I said, I don't want this to be the mark of my life. This is my story, yes, but this is not who Nikki is. You know what I mean? Yeah. I get to enjoy life and I laugh and I love nature and I love Marvel movies and yeah. I'll watch the Game of Thrones and the Wheel of Time and, you know, I I like to go to operas. and You know, like, I, I'm enjoying life. I'm not saying it's perfect and I'm not saying I don't still have a lot to unpack. I do. But like, like you talked about healing, I don't look at it as the therapist just snapped her hand and, I, and I'm healed or I go to a church and they pray for me and it's done. Healing in my mindset, it, it's an evolution and I get to be a part of it. It's not a sentence. It's not a punishment. I get to actually embark on my story, right? So I always like to use this analogy. The My book of life now the pen that used to write chapter one, two, three, four, whether it was my NARC family or this cult leader or that cult leader, they don't have that pen anymore. I have that pen now and I get to write my story and it may sound cheesy or redundant for some people, but for me, it's everything. I have choice and that was something I could not connect with yeah. in my life story, but I love it now. You know, so I don't know, it was a lot, but sorry. <laughs> you know. asked the right question. <laughs> yeah, I think anybody who thinks that analogy is cheesy has probably never had the pen taken out of their hand. Mm hmm. Mm hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Like, it is, it's not cheesy at all. And I love um, mm -hmm. it on your website where you talk about coming back to yourself. And I love that analogy. Mm -hmm. Was that is what it is like because you are there is that such a, a like Grand Canyon size disconnection with yourself mm -hmm. and and, and yes. who you are supposed to be right mm -hmm. so the process mm -hmm. is is about almost taking ownership over your own life again and that's yeah it's not cheesy that's incredible yeah yeah. 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 Because, you know, and in the black church, a lot of the songs and the hymns that are sung um, are kind of indicative of we'll suffer here, but we get to rest. Yeah. When we get to glory, we get to be at peace. Right. And I'm not saying anything's right or wrong with it, but after everything I've been through, I'm like, no, 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 no. I want joy here on this side in my physical body. I want to enjoy pleasure. I want to enjoy laughter. I want to be able to have interpersonal relationships. Does it feel risky? Sure. But curiosity, wanting to evolve, wanting to experience life, that helps to keep my anchor and my focus now, not pulling myself down, abasing myself, shaming myself, you know, 
And, you know, it took a lot to get here. Like I said, I never thought I would be doing this work, but it's just kind of coincidentally, haphazardly, whatever adjective you want to use, it, it fell on my lap and it resonated at the time it fell on my lap. And I said, you know what? I think this is what I'm supposed to be doing, at least in this season of my life. I don't know if I'll do this forever, but for now, this is where I'm supposed to be. And, and I enjoy it. Not for all the things or you get to meet. No, my favorite part of what I do is I like to go and sit right next to that survivor. So metaphorically, where they feel that no one sees them, no one hears them, no one understands them mm. and say, I see you. And we don't even have to move right now. Just tell me your story. It's OK. You know, I'm not trying to pull you into this and pull you into that. You need to work on no, 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 no. Mm. Right where you're sitting, right? Or right in that infirmary, I come and just sit right next to you. Like, I enjoy that because I remember when I started to untangle that Christmas cord, mm. man, was that hard. Yeah. You know, I tried to talk to people who were in the church. Can you pray for me? Mm. Pray for you. You were this intercessor. You were this awesome prayer warrior. You, uh uh, we're not going to accept this. This is the trick of the end. Like all the, you know, spiritual stuff that people do. And it just got so lonely. And, you know, my friend contacts on my phone just started to dwindle because it didn't feel safe anymore. Yeah. And, um, you know, but I'm, I'm, I'm grateful for my experience. If you want to say it sounds crazy, I don't endorse yeah. anybody going through abuse yeah. to get where I'm at. I don't endorse it. You know, I could still say if we could change time, I could, I could have not done this, you know, but I did. And instead of running for from it, I'm allowing lemonade mm. to be produced from the lemons that I, you know, I've, I've connected with in my life. And so now I say, so Samantha, do you want pink lemonade? You want strawberry lemonade? You want raspberry lemonade? You know, and I, I drink the lemonade for me first. And if someone happens to be walking past in a need, there you go, you know, but I'm not doing that because I have to, like when I was in the church, you need to witness, you need to, I'm doing it because I want to. And I, I enjoy my journey right now. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. I've been finishing these podcasts with one question, which is okay. what, what message, what word of wisdom, what would you say to somebody who is fresh in their deconstruction, fresh out of church, fresh out of whatever community mm -hmm. they're in, and their mm -hmm. entire center of gravity is gone? What would you say to them? Hmm. Great question, Samantha. We've got some good questions here. Um, <laughs> I would first let them know it's not your fault. I've said that a little bit earlier, I think, but like really hearing that it's not your fault, even if you had needs going in, like I said, that knapsack I had over my shoulder, I had needs, but even the fact that I was trying to get them met, that was not my fault. That's a human response, you know? Um, I don't think many of us who have experienced religious trauma and spiritual abuse and cults, I don't think anybody says, okay, sign me up for that cult, please. Yes, I want to be indoctrinated and manipulated, you know, and go through all. No, no one signs up for that. We signed up to have more of God. We signed up to belong. We signed up for a family, a community. We signed up to learn more things that can help us in our own personal uh, situations. So remember, that's what you were going into that community for, not what they made you think that you were. You know, it is not your fault. It's simple, but it's very profound. And I know I needed to hear that when I first came out because man, did I blame myself a lot. Mm -hmm. I really thought, oh, here you go again law of attraction, you attract, you know, all that stuff. And I just beat myself down, but no, this is, it's not your fault. Yeah. Second thing I would say is it may seem hard, but like I was talking about that book of life, you're not at the end of the chapter of your book of life, right? Mm -hmm. Chapters one through five or one through 10 
might have been written and it you look back at it and you're like, oh my gosh, I went through that. But there's more of your story to be written. Mm -hmm. Like I said earlier, it does not have to be defined by a cult leader. It does not have to be defined by a toxic spouse or partner or or family. You can define it. You have choice. You have agency. Whether you are connected with that reality or not, hopefully you will be be able to connect with that. But once you come into that, man, you start to see the clouds are are clearing a little bit, right? And then I also, the last thing I want to say is there is community now. Um, when I was going through it, I don't know about you, Samantha, I didn't have these Instagram accounts to connect with and these community groups and all that stuff. I had to cold turkey, do a lot of it on my own. I don't pride myself in it. I'm just saying it doesn't have to be that hard for many survivors now. Mm. Podcasts um, and retreats and mem memberships and people are talking about religious trauma. You don't have to do this alone. Mm. And the last thing I would say is as you are looking for someone to talk to about this, I would really encourage you find someone, even if it's one person that has the ability to be compassionate, that sees the beauty in you, despite that you walk through this, that will love you. Even if they say, I've never heard of this, but I want to know. If you don't find that type of safe person, connect with other survivors who have been through this. Yeah. Because the last thing people want or need is invalidation and re-traumatization because people are insensitive and are ignorant when it comes to this type of trauma and abuse. Yeah. But the story can unfold in a whole nother way. There is hope, right? Take my life as an example. It's not perfect. I still have things I work through. I still have my own therapist, right? But I have hope. And I know hope may hurt for some of us, but once you get to the point where you can see hope is a beautiful thing, I believe many of us will start to change that type of reality that we've been in and come home to ourselves. Yeah. So, yeah. Oh, thank you so mm -hmm. much. Yeah, this yeah, yeah. Wonderful. I um I think Oh my goodness, people, I think are just going to like their mind is going to be blown in this episode. <laughs> I love that. Um, but oh, thank you so much for joining me. Yeah. Yeah, this was so cool. Like I said, I haven't had the opportunity to, to tell my story in this well on Clubhouse, yes, because that's how I kind of started doing this work was um on Clubhouse and it was an audio app. So I shared more of my story there, but I not like this. Yeah. So, you know. Well, I am privileged. Um, Yay. I, oh, it's your style. I love how you do this. Perfect. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Thanks, mm -hmm. Nikki. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah. Thanks for listening to Beyond the Surface. Until next time, take care, stay true to who you are, and remember, your voice and your story matters, always.